There's a fascinating and incredibly rich mineral belt in New South Wales known as the Macquarie Arc. This geological feature contains an enormous amount of gold, copper, and trace amounts of silver among other economically significant minerals. The discovery of its origin is a narrative of immense geological investigation that involved professionals from multiple fields teaming together to finally discover how the Macquarie Arc was formed. What it uncovered is a truly incredible story. For over a century, the Macquarie Arc has puzzled geologists. How did it form and how did it become so mineral enriched? It's only in recent decades, thanks to advances in geological research and modern exploration techniques, that the answers to these questions have become clearer. The Macquarie Arc is among the top 5 gold and copper porphyry deposits ever discovered on Earth. For the past 15 years, the Cadia Mine, which opened in 1997, has ranked either first or second as Australia's most profitable mine. It's produced about 50 million ounces of gold and 1.1 million tonnes of copper since it opened. The Macquarie Arc is fundamentally different from the orogenic gold deposits that enriched Australia during episodes of mountain building and tectonic collision. Its origin lies in volcanic activity, specifically as a volcanic arc formed in a subduction zone. This ancient volcanic arc was not initially part of Australia. It formed in the Paleo-Pacific Ocean, separate from the continent. Over time, through tectonic processes, the volcanic arc was accreted to the Australian landmass, becoming part of the continent long after its formation. The story of the Macquarie Arc begins with volcanic activity that commenced during the Ordovician period, which spans from around 485 to 443 million years ago. It began with the subduction of the Paleo-Pacific Ocean beneath an oceanic region roughly 500 kilometers east of the continental land of Gondwana. I will clarify how we know this soon. So this was an oceanic to oceanic collision that occurred. As is usual with subduction zones, after the collision occurred, volcanic activity soon followed as the descending plate carried water towards the mantle. As the slab is forced deeper into the mantle under high pressure and temperature, the trapped water is released into the overlying mantle wedge. This introduction of water into the mantle lowers the melting point of the surrounding mantle rock. As a result, the mantle rock begins to partially melt, generating magma. This magma, being less dense than the surrounding solid mantle, rises towards the Earth's surface, eventually leading to volcanic activity. In an oceanic to oceanic subduction zone, the rising magma can produce volcanic islands, forming a volcanic arc above the subduction zone. Early stage volcanic activity in subduction related arcs is typically effusive, with explosive eruptions becoming more common as the magma evolves and increases in silica content. And this is exactly what happened in the Macquarie Arc. The early volcanic eruptions produced pillow basalts, which formed when basaltic lava erupted underwater, producing pillow-like shapes as it rapidly cooled and solidified beneath the waves. Pillow lavas are distinctive, bulbous formations that only form when lava erupts underwater where the surrounding water cools and solidifies the outer surface of the lava quickly, causing it to be shaped into pillow-like structures. The presence of pillow lavas in the Macquarie Arc confirms that its volcanic activity began under the sea. The Macquarie Arc can be divided into distinct phases of volcanism, each characterized by unique geological features and processes. Geologists have identified at least four major phases of volcanic activity in the region, with each phase marking significant changes in both the physical landscape and the geochemical properties of the volcanic materials. So phase 1 began with volcanic eruptions occurring on the sea floor, where it gradually built up volcanic cones beneath the ocean. In phase 2, these volcanoes would break through the waves of the Paleo-Pacific Ocean, forming island arcs. Eruptions slowly built up a string of volcanic islands, as there was a transition from effusive lava flows to more explosive volcanism. This phase was accompanied by significant sedimentary deposition, as the volcanic islands eroded over time, primarily due to the abrasion caused by ocean waves, leading to substantial volcanoclastic sedimentary deposits. These eroded volcanic sediment deposits, consisting of sand and boulders that have been worn down from the volcanic ash and lava, would flow down the flank of the conical volcanoes, gradually working to build up the sea floor, allowing it to transition from a deep environment to a shallower one. And this marked deposit of volcanic sediment is important, because as the ocean floor around the volcanoes built up and became shallower, life began to flourish and some of the Earth's first coral reefs sprang into existence. This is where paleontologists come into the picture. They played a crucial role in piecing together the geological history of the Macquarie Arc by studying the fossilized remains of marine animals preserved in the limestone strata. 
that formed as the volcanic arc emerged through the waves of the ancient Pacific Ocean. The limestone contains some of the earliest corals, trilobites and mollusks, such as nautiloids and gastropods, which not only helped scientists date the rocks, but also provided valuable insights into the marine ecosystems that once thrived in the area. By identifying these fossils, paleontologists were able to reconstruct the environmental conditions that existed at the time, such as the depth of the water. Brachiopods, for example, offered clues to the depth of the ancient seas, as different species are known to inhabit shallow versus deep water environments. The presence of these fossils and the conditions in which they are found allow researchers to determine not only the age of the geological layers, but also the changing environmental conditions. But fossils also provided a clue into something we've yet to discuss, the massive sea of sandstone that surrounded the Ark. This baffled geologists studying the Macquarie Ark because sandstone typically forms in shallow marine or terrestrial environments, unlike the deep marine setting where a volcanic arc would normally develop, which typically hosts vast deposits of mudstone or shale. This unusual association raised questions about how a volcanic arc, expected to form far from continental sediment sources, came to be bordered by such an extensive sedimentary layer of sandstone. The puzzle of the sandstone's origin and age began to unravel with the discovery of conodon fossils within the sandstone layers. Conodons are an extinct group of jawless vertebrates, best known for their hard mineralized tooth-like structures called conodont elements, which were located in their oral cavity and were used to process food. Conodont elements are crucial to further understanding the Macquarie Arc, as it is the only part of the animal that was fossilized after death. When these animals died, the fossilized conodont elements became deposited on the vast sea of sandstone, that stretched from the Macquarie Arc up to Gondwana. These fossils were dated and the dating of it revealed that both the sandstone and the Ark are the same age. This revelation led to the understanding that whilst the Macquarie Ark wasn't present on the continental area of Gondwana, it wasn't far away from the land either. Rivers on Gondwana were eroding rocks on land and were carrying sand into the deep ocean that lay to the east of Australia. This proves that mainland Gondwana wasn't far away from the Ark. So we have a sea of sandstone separating the Ark from Gondwana, and shallow limestone that formed around the volcanic islands as they eroded and created shallower marine environments. This allowed for the development of coral reefs and a deposition of limestone in these shallow warm waters. Today's video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. Here's something a lot of people don't realize. When you browse the internet without a VPN, your activity is like an open book. Internet service providers can track every site you visit, everything you search, and even how long you stay on each page. Using the internet without private internet access is like mining for gold without securing your claim. Anyone can swoop in and take what you've worked for. Your data is valuable, and without a VPN, it's at risk. But with private internet access, your data is protected. Without a VPN, your connection is especially vulnerable on public Wi-Fi networks, like at airports, cafes, or hotels where hackers can easily intercept your data. Their no logs policy has been proven multiple times in court, so you can trust your privacy is safe. Private internet access creates an encrypted tunnel, locking your information away with military grade encryption. And it's not just about security. Streaming services like Netflix, Disney Plus and Amazon Prime restrict certain shows based on where you are. With private internet access, you can change your IP address to one of 91 countries or all 50 US states, unlocking content that's otherwise unavailable in your region. Private internet access works on all major platforms, Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS and more. And one subscription covers unlimited devices, so you can protect everything with one account. Plus signing up is risk free. You get 83% off plus an extra 4 months for free, which is only a couple of dollars a month. And if it's not right for you, there is a 30 day money back guarantee and 24 7 customer support. So click the link in the description to sign up or go to piavpn.com forward slash osteology. And thanks again to Private Internet Access for sponsoring today's video. This is where we discuss the geochemical compositions of the Ark, which allowed us to understand the evolution of it. Geochemistry is fascinating. It allows us to understand the differences in tectonic settings and source rocks that lead to distinct magma compositions. In subduction zones like the Macquarie Arc, ancient altered oceanic crust subducts beneath another plate. This process releases water into the mantle, which helps the mantle to melt and introduces new elements into the magma, giving it a subduction zone chemical fingerprint. Water brings with it important elements like rubidium, potassium and barium, which are key indicators of the subduction process. 
As the mantle melts and the magma rises, it carries the unique chemical signature of a subduction zone. By analyzing the cooled rock, geochemists can determine its origin. One of the most revealing clues comes from trace elements, rare but crucial components that provide insight into the magma's source. Scientists can measure trace elements such as lead, strontium and neodymium at incredibly precise levels, down to parts per billion. Through this method, it was discovered that the Macquarie Arc, including its high calc alkaline rocks, was almost certainly formed in an intraoceanic arc setting, above a subduction zone but far from any continental crust. The trace element analysis revealed no geochemical evidence of continental crust involvement, confirming that Gondwana, the continental landmass, remained far to the west during the formation of the arc. However, scientists also noticed a change over time. By analyzing more rocks, they found that the chemical composition of the ancient lavas shifted. Slotting these variations into the fossil timeline allowed them to divide the arc's history into four distinct phases, revealing the complex evolution of the Macquarie Arc. This brings us to Phase 3. At this point, subduction had occurred for around 30 million years. It was marked by pronounced changes in geochemical composition, likely due to the influx of seamounts within the subducting plate. These seamounts clogged the system and created added compression in the volcanic system, trapping magma deep within the crust and altering its mineral composition. The eruptions of the arc likely became more explosive compared to the earlier phases. This phase produced andesitic to dacitic magma, which is more viscous than the basaltic magma of earlier phases. As the magma became more silica-rich, it also trapped more gases, leading to the build-up of pressure that resulted in highly explosive eruptions. These eruptions likely produced pyroclastic flows, ash falls and other typical features of explosive volcanic activity, marking a clear transition from the more effusive volcanism of the earlier phases to a more volatile rich volcanic environment. In the final phase of the Macquarie Arc, just before the subduction system came to an end, a transformative period of volcanism occurred that would ultimately shape the arc's rich mineral wealth. This last stage saw a shift in magma composition, possibly triggered by renewed subduction, which introduced fresh arc lavas and created ideal conditions for the formation of the arc's valuable mineral deposits, releasing vast amounts of copper and gold. One of the most significant outcomes of the volcanic activity within the Macquarie Arc is the formation of porphyry mineral deposits, particularly in regions like the Cadia Valley. These deposits form through magmatic hydrothermal processes, where large volumes of molten material from the Earth's crust and mantle rose to fill vast batholithic magma chambers situated 6 to 10 kilometers below the surface. As this molten material convected and circulated within these chambers, it facilitated the extraction of metals, including copper and gold from the magma. The exsolution of hydrothermal fluids followed, transporting these metals upward along porphyry intrusions to locations about a kilometre below the surface. Here, the fracturing of rocks allowed for the deposition of valuable minerals, often associated with quartz veins. The relationship between gold and copper became particularly evident, with gold often found in association with chalcopyrite and occasionally appearing as free gold within quartz veins linked to bornite. Other minerals, such as magnetite and pyrite, also played significant roles in the mineralization processes within the porphyry deposits. The geological history of the Macquarie Arc takes a distinctive turn with its collision with Gondwana. The collision was unlike typical subduction scenarios, as the arc and a continent were situated on the same tectonic plate, separated by a wide ocean floor filled with sandstone. As subduction ceased, the site where the subduction zone occurred ultimately became fused together but the Pacific Plate continued its westward movement, ultimately leading to the inevitable collision between the Macquarie Arc and Gondwana. The ocean floor, comprised of several kilometres of sandstone, became trapped and wedged between the two landmasses. All the layers on the sea floor were deformed and compressed against Gondwana's eastern margin, crushing and uplifting the island chain and surrounding sandstone. As this sea floor rose to form new land, the Macquarie Arc was broken up and divided into several distinct belts. These belts are now mined in present day, and contain substantial amounts of gold and copper. Today the sandstone, limestone and the Macquarie Arc stand as uplifted geological features, offering crucial insights into the ancient tectonic, volcanic and marine processes that shape the region, with the rich mineral deposits of the Arc continuing to be of economic and scientific importance. So this is the story of the Macquarie Arc and its mineral deposits. I hope you found this to be as fascinating as I did. 
And as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.